Good afternoon and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. Uh, those of you who have watched my channel over the last year or so, you're probably familiar with some of the Ensman starships um, that I've described on this channel, some of the amazing capabilities, and the fact that some people believe that they might become a reality sometime in the next century or so if we had the will to build them. Um, that being the case, then we are joined by Dr. Ensman's widow, Joanna Ensman, and Jay Snyder. Would uh, the two of you be so uh, kind as to introduce yourselves to the viewers? We'll start with you, Joanna. Well, hello. I'm Joanna Ensman. Robert and I were married for 62 years, so there must be something there. Uh, he was very busy his whole life. His main thesis is really space travel, spaceship, uh, and it, he really he started I think when he was very young, thinking about flying to the moon, flying to stars. He just always wanted to go out, and he persisted from well his entire life, and he lived to be ninety five. So that was a very long life. Indeed. Um, and and uh, an age I probably will not reach. So a, a fortunate man indeed, especially to have a life partner as long as that. And uh, Mr. Snyder, uh, if you'd be so kind as to introduce yourself and your background. Hi, uh, I'm Jay Snyder, and I'm the executive director of production for FRIA, the foundation for research of the Ensman Archive. And we started in 2019, but my relationship with Bob Ensman goes back to 1988. And uh, for, uh, uh, for several years, um, I spent uh, time working with Bob, working for Bob, and uh, working with Joanna uh, uh, on their home as a contractor. And uh, of course, I've always had an interest in publishing and uh, what I saw at uh, uh, at Bob's in Bob's room was an archive of science related papers and literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper and as a publisher I figured well that'll give me something to do uh, and something to publish and so we started Fria in 2019, in the spring of 2019, to do exactly that. And uh, we published his book on the Echo Lance. We published his book on uh, AI uh, from the 1960s uh, called Althea. And we've also published sort of the uh, uh, omega of his uh, sci fi universe. Uh, in Verity's Dragon, another AI story. So uh, there's many, uh, many things I, I could share with you about the archive. So uh, uh, in due time, I assume, we're building uh, an AI program, a Q&A re re retriever, uh, to uh, uh, read the PDFs of all the paper that we are scanning. and. Uh, we have literally over 250,000 pages of his personal work. And uh, it covers two dozen themes or two dozen topics, and uh, um, not the least of which is uh, science and physics and math and astronomy uh, and starships, but he also was a prolific author when it came to writing his memoirs and his diaries and stories about his life. And uh, so there's a tremendous wealth of history uh, that has never before seen the light of day. Uh, he was a secretive person. He had secret clearance from an early age and uh, was taught in British embassy schools in kindergarten. So he spoke several languages uh, at the age of five or six. Um, so I was 
And as a matter of fact, I was just scanning some of his history today, uh, meeting with Colonel Hess uh, from uh, a, a Russian officer in 1930 in discussing fission. And ever since that, as a young child, he knew it was possible. And so, and his life story unfolds, uh, basically at, with that as his magnum opus. But uh, we need a computer to help us go through all the paperwork. Sounds like an incredible task that you have laid out before you. Mrs. Ensman, uh, what I do know is that you, uh, that you studied mathema uh, mathematics um, at, uh, at MIT. Um, a number of my, uh, my peers also uh, went to MIT. My daughter was accepted to MIT, but ended up in staying in Clemson as an engineering student. Um, but I'm just curious, uh, one of the, the topics that, uh, that uh, Michelle Snyder and I discussed the possibility of us going over was the subject of time dilation, which is an extremely um, confusing topic to many of my viewers, people who really don't grasp how all that works. And frankly, I can't even say that I thoroughly grasp how it works. Um, is that a topic that we could discuss a bit and perhaps you could uh, lay it out a bit for the layman as to why time changes the closer you get to the speed of light? Well, I can do my best to put it in simple terms. Please. Well, the theory is that as you go faster and faster, although the person going faster doesn't try to really observe anything different whatsoever, uh, it's just that when you come back to where you started, you find that time there has gone very much faster and you have essentially gone into the future. Uh, it is the it has been shown that time does slow if by putting time very sensitive clocks into orbit. I know that they it they do show that time does slow down that the objects in orbit are aging much more, well, a little bit more slowly since they are not going that much faster. It's just that you have to get very close to the speed of light before you are going to notice a great deal. So if you are traveling very close to the speed of light, what you will probably notice, and this is something that Robert had laid out, you'll notice a shift in the stars around you. It's a, a combination of aberration and the Lorentz contraction that the colors will tend to shift into a, a rainbow ahead of you and the stars will tend to shift in front of you. This is well a, related to the time dilation. I know I have read other people who theorize that it, if this will work or this won't work, but I think it will. However, the time, instead of taking, you know, a great many years to reach a planet, you will find that you get there you know, much more quickly. A, there's a very rather simple formula that tells you how much you will be slowing down and how much time will expand and I believe it is a true formula. It's one that the Dr. Lorenz had first theorized oh, more than a hundred years ago, I think late 1800s, and has been proven correct ever since. But you have to get very close to the speed of light. And I don't know if that really explains it. No, it does. Um, uh, now, one thing that I know is that the relationship is sort of 
exponential. That is to say that if the, dif the difference in how much time changes is not too extreme, say between 90% and 99%, but once you're, you're chewing up that last percentage point, like the difference between 99.5%, for example, and 99.99% is gigantic, right? It, it kind of is an exponential relationship that, uh, that becomes much more pronounced um, in those last few fractions of a percentage of the speed of light. Is that kind of how it works? Well, yes, that's very true. If you're going even 50%, you really won't notice that much difference. If you're going 90%, you'll start to see a difference. And you have 95, 98, then the, the curve, if you draw out a curve of the line, it really goes zooming up. You know, it goes along, 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 and then swoop. Right. And you get to 99.9%, and your, your time is virtually standing still. Okay. So you'll get to where you're going pretty fast, but you have to slow down an awful lot when you get there. Right. You can't really spend too much time, well, too long a, a stretch at 99.9%. Now, I've heard people theorize that if you were indeed um, traveling you know, within those last few decimal points to the speed of light, you could get to the point to where in a normal human lifetime you could reach the Andromeda galaxy or even further into the universe, that you could actually traverse millions of light years um, in the space of a, of a human lifetime. Do you believe that that's possible? Well, that is theoretically possible. That's true. If you're going at 99.9% the speed of light, you're going to get to a very far place very fast. You're going to go zipping right by it, too. So I'm not sure how practical it is. But if you really want to go a long way, that's how to do it. Of course, the engineering part of it is a little bit beyond us at this point. But I think it will be possible. Well, it's very exciting to think about. Certainly exciting for science fiction writers to postulate all that. Of course, it's important also for the viewers to remember that uh, although perhaps, you know, two million years may have passed in the outside world and only about 40 or 50 for you, that the people you left behind on Earth are two million years older at that point. They're long gone in dust for a long period of time after you've made that decision, right? To, to travel between galaxies, you're leaving everything else behind forever. Yeah, you can't come back. I mean, there's no reason to come back. It would, there's just nothing left for you here. If you're going out, it's a one-way trip. I suppose we can say it's still a theory. It hasn't been conclusively proven, but I believe it is true that it will happen. Just as we theorized that nothing could travel faster than the speed of light, although I know at one time it was theorized that there were a thing called tachyons that were faster than light. But the problem is, how on earth do you capture one? How do you find it? So it remains a nice theory, just as this dilation of time is a nice theory. and. We believe it's true. We believe the Starpo is true. And until we actually get out there and try it, well, it's still a theory. Well, this is a question for either you or, or Mr. Snyder. How do we try this in the future? I mean, the, the Echo Lance obviously is, is a prospect that's been put in front of us, but is it, I mean, is something that ambitious really within our technological capabilities in the 21st century? Well, it, in my research of the Ensman Archive, um, uh, Bob adamantly insists that star travel is possible with the technology we have today and uh, just the evidence of, of his engineering the ships uh, the fleet of ships 
but also um, in relation to the time dilation, uh, I was scanning pages of the archive today, and, uh, and on the back of one page, he had handwritten in the corner that, uh, that time is plural, but location is singular. So if you think of a starting point and an ending point, uh, you, can, you can cover a number of locations. Uh, I like to call it, we could go anywhere in no time. And, uh, and that, that concept uh, is, is carried uh, very much with the uh, propulsion systems uh, that he has invented, I guess, uh, using uh, beam propulsion and uh, particle accelerators to gain momentum. Um, that will get you close to the speed of light, if not past it, uh, as you continue to add momentum. So these concepts to him were already uh, worked out, and, uh, and he, was, he wanted to go in his lifetime. As a matter of fact, there were pre-NASA plans uh, written by Ensman, uh, that I find in his history pre-NASA in which uh, through the Orion project if they could if they could put a ship uh, move a ship through space with uh, an Orion engine uh, what could a ship do with eight Orion engines so uh, the engineering is uh, is um, is there but uh, unfortunately uh, with the advent of uh, the SALT Treaty uh, in 1963, when nuclear propulsion or nuclear explosions in space uh, were outlawed by the UN uh, th through that treaty, then uh, that was, you know, the plans to do that, the, the Apollo project was much larger than the Apollo mission that we saw and all of it ultimately was scrapped in less than 10 years. Uh, they spent uh, $25 billion on Apollo, and, uh, and after the end of Apollo, they spent uh, six or seven times that in, uh, in Vietnam. So, uh, so society and governments, uh, what Bob calls uh, uh, the Apollo plans were politically truncated. And he spent his entire life um, taking the ball and going home. Uh, he, had, he held worldwide conferences at the New York Academy of Sciences and, uh, and invited scientists from all over the world. He published Von Braun's papers uh, and he was uh, a leader in the industry um, and uh, went to work for private companies. And so uh, he retired from Raytheon and spent pretty much his entire life uh, writing about uh, everything that he did. Well, Some of it were science fiction now in terms of the, some of the specifics you're talking about because some of the things you mentioned are going to perk the ears of, of many of my viewers number one i guess you made a mention if not faster did he actually believe that the infinite mass restrictions of the speed of light could somehow be superseded his quote was he never said it was impossible well and that there be some uh there may be some facts that we have overlooked. Well, yes, that's always true. We, we certainly never understand everything. We're very difficult to understand everything. And then, then the other thing, the concept of 
eight Orion engines for the benefit of the uh, of the viewers and and correct me if I'm wrong here the Orion engine refers to small thermonuclear um, uh, bombs being dropped behind a ship that has a large pressure plate you're transferring the momentum of the explosions to the pressure plate in order to generate velocity so so he theorized about putting a bunch of these into one uh, into one ship in order to to generate uh, more thrust. Did did he really did he put out any any designs with with uh, with that in mind? By 1984, uh, Edwin Pangman uh, was a, a project engineer. Uh, drew pictures of the pulse. Uh, Starship, and but on it there were thirty-four pulse engines, and so and then there was also a ring of pulse engine tugs that would assist the ship in its maneuver uh, uh, periapsis around the sun and uh, and around Jupiter and uh, to reach uh, greater velocities in a shorter amount of time. My, that's uh, impressive stuff indeed. Uh, and Mrs. Ensman, how often did your husband talk about these topics to you? I mean, was this like an every night thing experience? And, and I mean, given the fact that you are a mathematician yourself, you're also capable of comprehending what he was talking about, which probably meant that he unloaded on you all the time. Is that kind of how it was? Or, or what, was the, what were things like in that regard? Well, I wouldn't say we discuss these things that often. Once in a while, if he had a problem, especially a mathematical problem, then we would go over what he was doing. But mostly he did his writings, which he tended to do all, all as, for as many hours as he could, and consulted me when he needed some help on some part of it. I was aware of what he was doing, but we weren't talking about it every night. Do you have a passion for these things as well, Mrs. Ensman, or or do you, it? Uh, what are your interests? Well, you know, pure mathematics was never my thing. When I discovered computers, which was when I was a sophomore in college, which was in the dark ages of computing. That was what I fell in love with, and I've been, well, I was a computer, a software engineer, I think that term was invented long after I became one, uh, just as I think I was a nerd before they, long before they invented that term too. After all, I graduated quite a few years ago, 1958 in fact. My. So, and I've spent my whole career in programming computers, software engineering, uh, largely for the military, since that seemed to be where the opportunities were, and I loved it. All right, well, you've just inspired me to kind of go off on a bit of a tangent here then, Mrs. Ensman. Um, of course, the whole concept of hyper-intelligent AI is a huge topic at the moment. What are your feelings in that regard? How close are we to duplicating human consciousness in a computer, or can that be done? And as is the case with most of the interviews where I get a little carried away, this one went over on time and we're going to have to break it up into two parts. So stay tuned. I'll be releasing the second part in the next day or so. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, stay angry about space.